welcome to the council for strategic affairs round table discussion we have a monthly round table discussion today's topic is very interesting just for the sake of record today is february 7th uh, 17th saturday around 10 a.m. a few minutes past East Coast time. Those of you of you who registered using our even bright announcement probably saw this flyer that tells about the topic. And the topic is Texas US conflict geopolitical implications. And as you know, it is a very important issue at this point in time. But before we start the roundtable discussion, a little bit about Council for Strategic Affairs. CSA imparts education in the field of international relations. The Council fosters discussion, dialogue and debate on geopolitical issues. CSA encourages strategic studies in general to raise the level of awareness. We as an organization condemn terrorism in all its forms worldwide. Council for Strategic Affairs aims to contribute towards world peace and pro prosperity. And the council promotes people to people contact and track to diplomacy. A little bit about our programs. We have a monthly roundtable discussion, usually on second Saturday of each month at 10 a.m. Eastern Day Time. There's a monthly guest lecture by a domain expert on usually on fourth Saturday of each month. Then the, we have a column called Strategically Speaking with Dr. Adityanji, that is myself, and it's a one on one interview. We organize symposia, meetings, and conferences. We promote publications of articles on geopolitics and related subjects. There's a summer internship program for college students. And there's a fellowship training program in strategic studies. So that is our overall program. Let's start with today's roundtable discussion, US-Texas conflict, geopolitical implications. We have very three powerful distinguished participants, and you will see them soon. This is Mr. Bert Thakur. Bert started his professional and American dream in 1980 when he joined to attend Valley Forge Military Academy in Pennsylvania. After graduating, he enlisted in the US Navy and gave up his Indian citizenship in order to serve the US. Bert served as a nuclear reactor operator on aircraft carrier USS Harry S. Truman. He retired with honorable discharge in 2006 after serving for six years. After service, Bird moved to California and worked for MMR Power Solutions. He built, operate, and managed co-gen power plants. He subsequently worked in critical power and is currently engineering project manager, facilitating construction processes for large data centers. In 2020, during presidential election, he won national recognition when he appeared on Jeopardy uh, during the final season of the host, Alex Trebek. He became a Jeopardy champion and received a lot of attention. And I am very happy to say that he has been covered in various mainstream media like Good Morning America, Fox News, CNN, etc., etc. He's very active on social media, and my understanding is that Bert is contesting for a congressional seat. Our second distinguished panelist is Prabhu Akshar Desai. Akshar Prabhu Desai is a technologist from Silicon Valley and alumni of IIT Bombay. He's a classical liberal and has been writing on immigration, technology, education policy on various platforms. He also runs Syndic Forum, a platform for history and Indology experts. He currently lives in California and Silicon Valley. He's an author and has written on this particular topic with a liberal perspective. 
compared to Bert, who has some what conservative views. And this is our third distinguished panelist. This is Caitlin O'Connor Esquire. She's an immigration attorney. Caitlin has been working with immigrants and non-immigrants for the last 10 years. She is committed to helping bringing families together and help them navigate through the immigration process. Each of her clients know they are very important are being treated fairly. She attended Indiana University and has been an attorney since she graduated from Loyola University Chicago School of Law in 2003. She is licensed in the states of Illinois and authorized to practice federal immigration law nationwide. Caitlin decided to pursue her passion for working with the international clients after spending several years working closely with J-1 visa holders. In her free time, Caitlin volunteers with immigrants and refugees and in the St. Louis area through IHEL and ISPN, where she is chair of the Legal and Housing Committee. She is member of the Illinois State Board, American Immigration Lawyers Association, and Association of International Educators. Caitlin will be speaking from a humanitarian perspective during this particular roundtable discussion. So all those who can see my screen can see this map of Texas. And this is the most famous saying, don't mess with Texas. Although it's about littering the highways, but it is also true. Otherwise, don't mess with Texas. Looking at the Texas, Texas's economy is $2.4 trillion. If we see from the perspective of scale of economies, it's the eighth largest economy in the world, larger than the economies of Russia, Canada, and Italy. It's a top state for Fortune 500 headquarters, now has 55 such headquarters. In 2023, Texas was the state of the year for best in nation business climate and job growth. Texas is ranked as the best business climate in the nation, produces 23% of US GDP, almost a quarter of US GDP, the value of all goods and services produced. Texas accounts for 22% of US exports, almost one fifth. Texas is the top exporting state now 21 years in a row, and Texas is the top tech exporting state 10 years in a row. It's the top semiconductor exporting state now 12 years in a row. Texas has been named by the CEOs as the best state for business 19 years in a row, among the best states to start business. The list goes on. And it has attracted more than 290 corporate headquarters since 2015. And the foreign direct investment over last 20 years, again, it's a top state. So again, I go with my don't mess with Texas, whoever is doing that. But the content, the topic for today's discussion is Texas US conflict. Texas has been facing the brunt of illegal immigrants on the southern border of the United States. Texas governor has been sending busloads of illegal migrants to sanctuary cities up north. Texas governor has installed a wire fence at the border, and the governor has activated the Texas border guards. The Texas governor has defied the U.S. Supreme Court orders, and the governor has sought help from other Republican states to provide reserves from their state reserves guards. So what is the outcome, likely outcome of this conflict? Will there be a possibility at some point in time that there may be confrontation in federal forces and Texas border guards? We have to discuss all these things. So it's my pleasure and honor to initiate the discussion with inviting my first panelist, and my first panelist is Mr. Bert Thako. So 
the floor is yours, Mr. Thakur. Kindly unmute yourself and you have 10 minutes to give your arguments. Bert Thakur, please. Well, Pranam, uh, Dr. Adityanji, uh, Ms. O'Connor, uh, 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 Mr. Desai, honored guests, uh, it's an honor to be here. I'm nursing a cold, so please pardon me if I sound a bit nasally. Uh, I am running for the Congress of the United States of America uh, here in Texas, in North Texas, actually. And part of what um, precipitated my run was seeing that plane take off from Afghanistan on August 26th of 2021 when I saw the bodies falling off the wings. It was so symbolic of the trajectory that our country was headed down. And I had lived before in Southern California uh, in a border district, and I'd seen firsthand that there was a situation where immigration was being supplanted effectively with uh, illegal immigration. I mean, there's just no way to put it. So why were we in a situation where over 3 million people thought it was okay to cross the border illegally, whereas only oh, slightly over a million people came across in the legal way? And there was a tremendous amount of suffering that I saw. I spent a week on a farm where I learned about how people even crossed the border. I, I saw people who had been, in a sense, doing these migratory patterns, if you will, where on the West Coast, you had the farming route in the, uh, in the, in the central and, and Midwest areas. Uh, you had the farming route that went all the way up to Illinois and back down on the East Coast, uh, a route that went all the way up to Pennsylvania and then down the coast. And then there were people who were just straight up being trafficked. There's just no other way to put it. In Ohio, I helped to break up a ring uh, outside of Chillicothe, actually, where they were using 12 year old boys to make A-frames and paying them 50 cents an hour, okay? Now that's just one small example of what, what being undocumented, what being trafficked is doing, okay? And it's clear as day, the 13th Amendment outlaws slavery 100% here in the United States. And yet we have a situation where slavery is continuing. Uh, there's a couple startling metrics. Uh, in December of 2023, uh, you know, there, there was a, a chart that I saw that there were over 12,000 unaccompanied minors who came across the border. And people traveling in families were about 101,000 and single adults were about 135,000. That was just in December alone of 2023. And I was speaking with a gentleman who's also running for Congress. His name is Victor Avila. He said that since Biden has taken office, there have been over 300,000 unaccompanied minors who had come across the border. And out of that, 100,000, we don't know their whereabouts. And so what kind of sane society uh, is it where we are saying, hey, it's okay. And, and, and I argue it's actually being done by design. When you take a look at these international agreements and I would argue treaties like the Declaration of North America, which Joe Biden signed with AMLO and uh, Justin Trudeau uh, in, in June of last year, which reaffirms the Los Angeles Agreement, which builds off of UN Agenda 2030. And it states that effectively migrants have been displaced because of climate change and therefore deserve asylee status and should be allowed to cross freely across the borders in search of work, you're creating an arguable humanitarian crisis. And I think one of the worst things that Joe Biden ever did was to suspend the 100 day, what was to place a moratorium for 100 days for deportation. Even Alejandro Mayorkas spoke up against it. And it created this massive flood of people who decided to come across the country, uh, come across the border. It's not just, this isn't just farmers. Uh, if anybody on this panel uh, doesn't realize that our enemies aren't exploiting the vulnerabilities. Let me tell you this. Look, the MSS in the CCP is 10 million strong, and they arguably, all of them, have an IQ above 130. To think for a nanosecond they're not exploiting the vulnerabilities uh, on our border, it's an absolute fabrication. Uh, there was a report that just came out at the end of January. I think uh, ProPublica had an article, and it was widely publicized over uh, in, in the Mexican news uh, outlets that Obrador had received over $2 million in payments from the cartels, 
you know, for his financing, specifically the Zetas cartel. So these aren't <laughs> these are not organizations uh, that that aren't extremely complex, and they they have they have business plans that would rival Fortune 500 companies and and a vision and an outlook. Now, how does this directly affect my district, and how is this affecting Texas? Well, I can tell you, uh, along my campaigning, ten miles right from where I live. Um, an elementary schooler died from fentanyl. Elementary school. Think about how insane that is. Every single town from Munster, Ponder, Paradise, Decatur, you name it. They have kids in elementary and middle school who are either overdosing or dying. Uh, I spoke to a school resource officer. Her name was Jeanette. And she said that this year, well, this past year alone, 14 kids uh, were overdosing just from fentanyl. And... I'd never seen fentanyl until I had gone to a border patrol station and it looked like those little Flintstone vitamins that you see. And there were two duffel bags that they had. You couldn't even be in that same room and breathe it. So then the question is, okay, what's happening? Well, there are large scale chemical operations and factories that are making them and they're using the border as, as a way of trafficking. Now, there are two ways to look at this situation. One is, What's cheaper? Is it cheaper to hire a coyote and go across the border? Or is it cheaper to go get some fake papers and try to make your way into the United States, right? Well, they both have their pros and cons. You can go get some documents for effectively $5,000, fake passport, maybe even less. Fake passports, social security card, get a ticket, get into a port of entry. Or you can come with a caravan. And I think the, 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 there is a growing idea here, and I think perhaps it's, it's definitely worth exploring, is that if you're going to be bringing in 22, 23, 24 million people and then pushing for amnesty, I think that on the Republican side of the United States, there is a concern that if these people will effectively be a large voter block of 22 to 25 million Democrats who will vote specifically Democrat up and down the line. Now, with that political theory aside, let's talk about how it's affecting services. So far, uh, I think the, the number I'd read was around $450 billion had been uh, allocated for various benefits uh, that were given for uh, legal aliens. So I know California alone, for example, spent 38 billion. Uh, this was before the flood from last year per year, 38 to 40 billion a year. I know Texas had a smaller amount, but you know, aggregate across the straits, states, you have a significant amount of people who are inside of the system that are using the services. So for example, healthcare, um, education, uh, virtually, if you, if you look in California, starting, I think January 1st of last year, whether you were undocumented, legal alien, or whatever, uh, up through 25, you were uh, entitled to receive Medi-Cal. There are 14 municipalities in the United States, Washington, D.C. Uh, uh, included, where legal aliens are allowed to vote in local elections. Uh, in addition to that, if you go on MIT's website, MIT's website says that if you are DACA or an illegal alien, uh, your education effectively can be free. And so my concern is... Uh, my concern is this from an Indian perspective. <laughs> Pardon me. I'm an immigrant. My family came here in, uh, and I was brought here in 1990. I have met so many Indian Americans who are here. And, and hopefully, um, Ms. O'Connor, you can, you can speak about this as an immigration lawyer. <laughs> Pardon me. So sorry. Um, when you have the H-1B visa process, because of the backlog, when you have 50,000 H-1Bs that are given a month, but the USCIS only allows relatively seven to 8,000 a month to be processed, that backlog now has extended where it is affecting our community so deeply that you have 150 year to 200 year wait times for some people. How is that fair? I've met people campaigning right now who have 20 year old who have been here for 20 years and their community college is max out of state tuition, how they have to go renew their visas every three years. And then when you have big tech, big tech with their L visa or 
with their you know h1 visas etc and then you have h4 visas i mean this backlog is insane and now you're talking about this just from a humanitarian crisis of okay somebody wants to have a good life well i argue aren't those who came here legally aren't they deserving of a good life aren't they the ones that also deserve the same amount of respect as everyone else if you're making 15 dollars a day on a farm in mexico but you're coming here and you're making 15 dollars an hour i argue Sir, that is immigration. That's not asylum. If you're making $20,000 a year, respectively, in India as a top level engineer, and you're coming here and you're making $200,000, I argue, sir, that is immigration. That is not asylum. And I can't tell you how upset I am that there are people who are getting asylum status, whether, whether it's people who have crossed the border illegally and sought asylum for various reasons. But yet, those who translated for the United States military during Afghanistan, and look, I'm no hero, okay? I, I, I served on an aircraft carrier. I did one mission with special forces, and I was a translator on that mission. But guess what? There's so many brave Afghanis who put themselves in harm's way, and now their families in harm's way because they translated with SFOD Delta and these other special forces groups. I spoke to a gentleman last week whose translator was actually killed. Him and his entire family were killed in Afghanistan and the State Department was not processing their asylum status so they could even come here. I spoke personally on a social media platform with, with a young lady who was hiding from the Taliban as they were outside and you could hear them shouting and there is no anger, sir, like the sound of a wife who's angry at her husband for doing the right thing, okay? And so why did those people who have helped us, don't, why did they not deserve asylum? Why is the system not better? So like Teddy Roosevelt said, complaining about something without offering solutions is whining. Here are some solutions that I'm proffering. Number one, we create a new type of visa for seasonal or migrant workers. You know, take the Bracero Act, but federalize it. Let's make it so people who want to come here because there is an absolute need for farm workers. There's an absolute need. The entire economies will collapse. And that is not something that I, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to die on this hill. That's the reality. So why don't we allow for a, uh, a seasonal or a migrant worker visa? So people can come here, they can work, they can choose to go back home, they can, if they continue staying, you know, work with immigration lawyers to actually draft up legislation that makes sense. I want a six month moratorium on all immigration, six months. And the reason for that is I wanna fix this USCIS backlog or at least allow it to catch up. Part of this would involve having budgetary requirements for the USCIS to actually hire agents. I think in lieu of those 87,000 agents to collect taxes, Maybe we shouldn't worry about, you know, clawing back the five cents out of every dollar that we spent on Ukraine. Perhaps the better humanitarian re use of our government uh, uh, funded apparatchiks would be to actually service those who are trying to get their visas uh, transformed into permanent residency. Maybe it would be to actually uh, apply for those who, who are, uh, you know, I hope you understand. Third thing would be to vastly reform our asylum laws and to codify it where I believe asylum should be exceedingly rare, but it should be truly given for those who are seeking asylum. Those whose, whose very lives are in danger because of their race, their sexuality, their, their origin. And asylum should not be loosely defined as being, well, you know, you can't find work, so therefore you deserve asylum. I think that is, that is insane. And as, as a finality, I, I firmly believe that from, from a trade perspective, like you said, Texas is the eighth largest economy in the world standalone by itself right now. It's, it's exceeded California, if I'm not mistaken. So with that, Texas does about $35 billion in trade uh, per year. And I think it would behoove us if we not only developed strong partnerships with countries uh, in, in order to not only affect trade, but also to develop their respective industries for trade, because we should create centers where people want to also stay in their respective countries. I mean, take a look at what Modi has done with India. You know, there's still a large uh, 
uh, uh, if you will call it expatriation from India, but also there's a large number of growing youth who are staying in India as well. So perhaps this allows for a better, not only globalized economy, but also allows for uh, a more responsible immigration that's not just based off of, well, you know, climate change or displaced or war and famine. Perhaps we can all work together to kind of reduce that kind of stuff. Um, I think another facet of why we need to have a secure border, and part of this involves absolutely building a wall on the southern border, and not just a wall, but I say a smart wall with early drone deployment, with monitoring stations, is because if you take a look at the events that happened on October 7th in Israel and the Hamas terrorist uh, actions that happened on October 7th, we have some serious serious issues right now in the United States. I, I went to high school a block away from the World Trade Center and I was in the Navy when the towers fell. Yeah. I don't want that. Oh, oh, it's ten, 10 minutes is up. But uh, anyway, I hope you get my perspectives. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Bart. Uh, now it's my pleasure to invite Mr. Akshar Prabhu Desai. And Mr. Desai will be speaking from somewhat of a liberal perspective. And he has written on this particular problem. So, Akshar, the floor is yours. Please welcome. Yeah, uh, namaste and thank you for giving me this opportunity. Uh, yeah, I just want to clarify that a liberal perspective here means more like a classical liberal perspective rather than uh, the political left perspective. Uh, so, I just want to clarify that first. Um, yeah, I think uh, illegal immigration is a problem. Uh, you don't really want a chaos at your border. Any nation, when you have a border, you should be able to control it. You should be have, able to have some control on who enters, who leaves, right? And what are the criteria that you are able to set uh, on what kind of people can enter into your country? I think uh, most of us can agree on that. Most of the nations function on that principle. Uh, but U.S. is also an exceptional nation in the world. It has an amazing economy. It's like the engine of the world. Um, and it's growing very fast. Right now, we have record number of job openings, uh, very high employment, and all this creates kind of an economic pull for people to come here to find a better life for themselves. Uh, people do not necessarily care about your immigration laws as much as much as they care about their own life and making life better for themselves. So having a too much complicated law or law that has loopholes, you'll always find people from willing to exploit those loopholes in order to make their life own better. Uh, and when it comes to asylum law, yes, it needs some bit of a reform. But as we have seen, the U.S. Congress is unable to come on terms, come on any compromise uh, on uh, reforming this asylum law in any meaningful way. So I don't really see a path forward where uh, the Congress actually amends this asylum law in a way that um, it, it helps them control uh, the border more effectively. Secondly, I think I agree with Bert that we need a more seasonal worker visa so that a lot of economic migrants can actually come to US, contribute to US economy, and then go back. Uh, or if they want, they can uh, choose to stay here if it fits their needs. Uh, the, another problem with asyl, uh, the whole asylum and illegal immigration is a lot of the cities in the United States are offering a lot of incentives for not even to work. You know, The right to shuttle laws in New York, right, they are terrible. Uh, so they are pushing kids out of school so that the uh, immigrants can be sheltered in the school. The problem here is not really the illegal immigrants, but you have now created a incentive for people just to come here, hang out, uh, and not, not really work, uh, right? But if you create a seasonal workers visa, these people can find work well in advance, find housing well in advance, and actually line up at the port of entry so they can enter, uh, so that we can process them, we know who is coming in, and so on. Uh, I think Biden administration to some extent has failed uh, to do this. Uh, and the big difference between Trump administration and Biden administration is that at some point, Biden administration was actually, uh, sorry, Trump administration was actually using policies like remain in Mexico, uh, which were deemed too cruel by the next administration. And even when the people were encountered by border patrol, they should have been detained for at least some time. I think Biden administration failed to do that. And definitely that increased the Ill illegal immigration quite uh, significantly. But the question is, does, it re does this really harm United States? And most of the data suggests that probably no. A lot of these people are coming in. 
they are mostly working contributing to us economy and us you know is probably at a stage where our growth rates are really slowing down so we need a lot of young people but i do agree with the conservative perspective that you know we want our population to grow but we also should be able to have some criteria on who enters uh, and who we can stop and i think the us as a as an institution all our institutions are basically failing at this and what concerns me here even more is that both parties are unable to sit together and come up with any compromise to actually strengthen our institutions uh, in most cases what i can see is that everyone is engaging in very bad faith arguments they aren't really interested in any solutions but rather signaling to their core voters that you know they are either being too tough on immigration or you know are very pro immigrant like we saw with the border deal you know the way, the kind of arguments that were put forward to not even like work out a solution so, uh, so so i don't really see this illegal immigration uh, problem getting solved um, uh, anytime soon uh, secondly when it comes to legal immigration right again we, when we talk of bad faith arguments every time there is a bill proposed to solve some minor issue around legal immigration the immigration hawks will say no no but we need to deport people first or we need to fix the asylum law first without that we won't even do the small minor fix that makes life better for a very few set of legal immigrations and bert spoke about the green card backlog i think it's just a i think it's just a, a disgusting at this point that you are asking an illegal immigrant from india who had lived here for 10 years to just wait for maybe 200 years just to get green card uh and and this is just simply happening because of most of the politicians are just involving in just bad, bad faith arguments they support your bill they co-sponsor it but when it comes to voting they just have some ridiculous objections that we have seen in previous congress uh people raising uh arguments like oh we need to have diversity of languages and uh, what not in uh, a very small set of visa so uh if you look at just the worker visa there are only 140,000 or so green cards given to high skilled Im immigrants and people fight over this they claim these people are taking away jobs but on other hand you have like a couple of million people entering illegally and taking away those jobs anyways if you uh, agree to that uh, taking away jobs argument so it doesn't really make sense to put more restrictions on legal immigrants when you have uh, illegal immigration that's so much out of control so i think um, my my central point is that uh, us needs more people and uh, if we have to stay uh, like an engine of the world if we have to grow we need more people especially younger people uh, to our economy and that's kind of have been american strength and that's the kind of competitive edge us has over uh, russia uh, china and many other countries and people talk about china growing as an economic power but how many people are lining up outside chinese consulates to move to china and i, I don't see uh, th uh, those many in fact we see that in terms of illegal immigration there are this, the second largest group is now chinese nationals trying to leave a communist uh, country and entering united states and this is really good i think especially if there are very highly educated chinese people we should be just giving them green cards so they can come here and work instead of working in china but i don't see that happening because the political climate has simply become uh, far too toxic in my opinion um yeah so so the point is that i think us definitely needs more people illegal immigration is a problem but it can be solved by creating more visas and better immigration programs simplified immigration programs so the same the same people can still come to us work contribute to the economy and help us grow and i think that would make us a better place and a stronger country yeah so that's that's my uh pitch thank you very much indeed mr desai just for sake of our viewers and for sake of record, CSA is an apolitical organization. We do not hold any position regarding various political parties in the United States. That's why we were referring to conservative versus liberal position rather than party position. So we do not endorse any party point of view uh, in this particular forum being uh, uh, a non-political organization. Now it's my distinct honor and pleasure to invite Ms. Caitlin O'Connor, who is an immigration attorney, and she will be mainly discussing this perspective from a human rights and humanitarian perspective. So Ms. O'Connor, welcome, please. Thank you so much. 
Uh, so I'm going to do my best to discuss the humanitarian issues without discussing politics, but unfortunately that is almost impossible to do these days. Um, so uh, I do have some slides prepared. Um, if I could have that assistance. Put them on, please. Yeah. Uh, sharing. Slide. Sharing, so. Thank you. Yeah. Let me know if you are able to save. Yes, I can. Okay, so hopefully um, everyone can see this, but I want to um, talk about some of the new issues that we're seeing in the border crossings and what has led to this crisis, why it's humanitarian in addition to political. Um, so um, if you could move to the next slide. Um, thank you. Yeah, so this slide is basically from CBP and all of the slides and graphs I'm showing today are derived from Customs and Border Patrol. Um, so just to give that context, but uh, what you can see on this slide is that from 2000 to essentially 2023, we have seen ebbs and flows in migrant crossings. Now, this specific slide is related to entrance or asylees, migrants coming to ports of entry. Um, one of the, the things I've noticed, and I think as corroborated by this, the statistics, is that more people are coming through ports of entry uh, these days and presenting themselves. If you move to the next slide, um, you can see, I, I believe this is what we're seeing in Texas, where groups are coming and essentially not running and hiding from border patrol, but presenting themselves um, in large quantities and large groups of people. And, and that's where we hear all of the terms of the migrant crowds coming and, and coming to Texas. And it, it is a real problem for Texas. Um, but one thing that we should note is that the demographics of the of migrants today have significantly changed. Um, if you could move to the next slide. So what we've seen recently is that there is a high percentage of children and families that are coming across. Uh, something you can you can see in 2012 that only 10 percent were families. The, the statistics that I've seen are that previously the migrants that we had coming across in the early 2000s and up until 2012, 2013, they were single males, primarily from Texas, searching for economic opportunities. So that kind of addresses what my colleagues have stated, that they're looking for jobs, they're coming here to try and work, they want to get papers to work. What we're seeing today, I believe, is a significant shift in that people are not necessarily coming for economic reasons or um, to look for work. They're coming, I believe, out of desperation and to escape uh, conditions that are hazardous to their lives. So I believe that that change, that shift, Although the United States economy is growing and one of the strongest in the world, I believe that the increased migration and what these statistics of the increased number of families shows is that they're escaping something other than economic persecution or oppression. Um, there's something bigger and more at issue. Uh, could you move to the next slide, please? We've also seen a difference in the makeup of migrants. So if you look at this statistic, it shows the number of people, as I mentioned, were primarily coming from Mexico uh, in the early 2000s. That shifts as we move through time to what they call the Northern Triangle, Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador, I would argue Nicaragua, um, and some of those other countries where people were coming to escape, you know, gang violence and as well as economic issues. Uh, what we've seen recently since 2020 is over half of the migrants coming are from other countries. And from my personal experience and my personal practice, I have seen the makeup of migrants and the countries of origin change as events uh, happen globally. 
So uh, two years ago, we saw Ukrainians and Russians coming through the border and we through the Mexican border. Um, and we saw people from Venezuela and uh, Argentina and other countries that were experiencing issues uh, politically and economically. And they were coming here to um, seek refuge and seek asylum. Uh, so if you could move to the next slide, please. So one of the things that we're dealing with are our current immigration laws, and I can address um, the issues raised about, you know, our current laws, the H-1Bs, seasonal workers, and things like that. But just speaking on the asylum and refugee laws, our last official legislation on refugee laws was in 1980, in the Refugee Act of 1980. Um, things have significantly changed <laughs> since then. Um, it's over 40 years old and just technology alone has significantly changed. Um, so in addition to that, the system we're using at the border has changed. And I believe Mr. Thacker mentioned kind of upgrading our border and um, how to upgrade this, the border patrolling. So drones, um, the United States recently uh, if, if you're aware, the CBP-1 app, which would allow people to um, enroll and seek asylum in a more orderly fashion. Now, unfortunately, that system crashed and has had many issues, which I believe many of our H-1B workers would be able to fix very quickly. But unfortunately, there it's been fraught with problems. Um, but I think that is one thing we need to look at is how we process people at the border and how we accommodate this increased number of people. Um, additionally, I think one thing that's important to note is that each administration, and as was noted by both of my colleagues, each administration is reluctant to act in a way to enact long-term immigration change. No one wants to be viewed as too pro-immigration, but nobody wants to be viewed as too negative either. So we're stuck in the middle at a stalemate of not allowing, of, of doing essentially what I would call band-aids to a system that needs a, a more significant overhaul. Um, and, and primarily what that looks like is that each administration um, tries to aggressively enforce the laws as they exist, rather than addressing the underlying problems in those laws. So um, I think what what one of my first slides showed in the number of the initial number of border crossings was that, uh, yes, that second slide. We see that with each enactment, there is a slight dip. So, you know, when Trump became president in 2016, we saw a dip, but it eventually goes back up. And so I think regardless of who is president, whether it's in 2000, 2008, you see these ebbs and flows as different administrations come in. And I think my point is that no administration has been able to control or effectively manage in a long-term fashion the, uh, the issues at the border. So while each administration has their own policies and, and ideas and thoughts, um, they, they are, those people are still coming and, and despite, you know, our best efforts to prevent that, um, they're, they're still coming. Uh, so if you could move to my last slide, um, so my proposed changes. So what types of solutions are, do I believe would be able to address this system? One of them would be increasing resources to CBP. Uh, that includes not just processing for asylum, but Im improving the ports of entry. Um, as I mentioned, the system it was used to young single males coming and entering. And now that we have families and children and entire family units coming, our border, our ports of entry need to be able to accommodate that. I'm not suggest suggesting a welcome lounge but I'm suggesting something that accommodates the needs of a different demographic and a different population. 
the next thing we need to do, as one of my other colleagues, both of them have suggested, is clear the asylum backlogs. These are both in court and at USCIS. So um, the the recent, I, I know Mr. Thacker suggested a six month pause in immigration uh, to catch up. Um, I unfortunately don't think that that would even make a dent um, in our policy. And aside from my other views on that idea, one of the facts that I would argue is that as of January 2023, we had 1.87 million cases um, in that were pending in immigration court only, so not affirmative cases in USCIS. Um, uh, based on that statistic, if no new cases were added moving forward, it would take over five years to clear that backlog. So six months, I think, would be a drop in the bucket and would not affect the outcome, unfortunately, or the, the backlog of asylum cases at this point. Um, additionally, I think we need to update our current policy. As I mentioned, our laws were enacted in the 1980s. We need to update those to reflect the current uh, struggles of asylum seekers. The, the reasons for coming here are much different than before. Um, the next aspect is I think we need other people assisting. This is not just a United States problem. We need to get third parties involved. We need to get NGOs, the UNHCR, having them involved in processing people in their home countries rather than and, and having that be a viable option for them to apply for a refugee program and seek um, seek status as a refugee in the United States, be approved, vetted and permitted entry would go a long way and would uh, help potentially de deter the migrant crisis and the migrants coming forward. Uh, and finally, uh, utilizing technology as alternatives to detention, but also to uh, patrolling. So the CBP-1 app is just one small example of what that could, could look like. Um, but we also have a program called ISAP, which is um, a monitoring program where people are sent back, sent away from the detention centers with monitoring and check-ins and cell phones and GPS devices to ensure that they are um, complying with the laws but are not being held in detention at the government's expense. So those are those are my proposed changes, my summary of the problem. Um, again, I don't think you can separate the politics uh, from the humanitarian. Um, but I think it's crucial to consider the humanitarian issues. Um, I am open to discussing questions about economic um, immigration and H-1Bs and all of those things as well. Um, but that's my basic summary about what I believe is the, the most pressing problem right now at the border. Thank you very much indeed, Ms. O'Connor. That was a very lucid and helpful presentation with your bullet points about the solutions, uh, possible solutions, I am very thankful. Uh, so we have three panelists give their opening statements. Now we will have a round of questions from me to all the three panelists, and subsequently, you know, we will have some questions from the audience that are being put in the chat room. So let me start with our first panelist. But before I do that, I will make a correction. When I was speaking, I misspoke and I used the word Texas Border Guard. It is Texas National Guard. Somebody from the audience corrected me, so I stand corrected. It is Texas National Guard that have been activated. So the question I have is for Bert. Bert, there's a confrontation between Texas and United States on this particular issue. If push comes to shove, where it is going to end? You know, cutting on the wire fence and then requesting some other states to send their National Guard to Texas to help with the problem. Will United States send the federal agents? And will there be, is there a possibility of confrontation between Texas National Guard and federal agents? 
I met with Governor Abbott about a week and a half ago and uh, spoke with him and his team about Operation Lone Star, which, look, I'll, I'll just say it. I think Governor Abbott single-handedly stopped an invasion. Uh, and to, to put the numbers into perspective, uh, just in, in October, over 300,000 people crossed the border illegally in Texas. I mean, people were coming across at some points 10,000 a day in down in Del Rio. Um, and that is completely overwhelming us. So I'm, be before I answer your question, let me just say really quickly that, look, just from the perspective of taking care of US citizens, 85,000 of my brothers and sisters who are veterans rest their head on a concrete pillow every night. We have 800,000 children every single day who go to bed hungry. We have 8 million people in the United States alone who are living below the poverty level. And so if you're introducing 3 million people that are wholly dependent on the nature of the system, I, I, I know Ms. O'Connor spoke about, well, you know, we need to have NGOs, et cetera, but guess what? These NG, NGOs are actually directing people with maps and routes on how to get in and to, you know, if you go to the Phoenix airport, good luck boarding a plane. Every second person is an illegal alien with, with a bracelet ready to go anywhere. And so fundamentally, the question is, if, is the US government going to do its duties to protect the border of the United States? And I think that's where the crux of the Supreme Court argument lies, is because of this concept of deferred supremacy. So the supremacy clause in the Constitution effectively states that any law that is uh, made in the federal government supersedes states' laws. But the courts have always ruled in favor of deferred supremacy, which is that if you have uh, federal agencies, let's say Border Patrol or you know Homeland Security, whatever statutes or laws that they make are assumed to have deferred supremacy over states' laws, even though they're unelected, because they are in effect working on behalf of and having oversight from Congress. Now, the Supreme Court ruling didn't say that uh, uh, Governor Abbott couldn't put up barbed wire. It said that the U.S. government can come and cut down said barbed wire, which is why immediately in a show of performance, more barbed wire was rolled out. <laughs> okay. Now, the entry of uh, of of the uh, of the border patrol being blocked by the Texas National Guard, you know, that's in that gray area. You know, is it state land? Is it federal land? You know, then it becomes a jurisdictional issue. And I think with what's playing out in the courts right now. I, a bigger question to me is why is Joe Biden or why is this current administration not having an ironclad border policy? Um, some of the reasons that I would hazard is because there's a, you know, immigration is big business. There's a lot of money to be made for people to basically be enforcing said laws. You have, a, you know, in this border bill, which I recommend everyone reads. It's 368 pages long. There's over $15 billion already going to NGOs. When you're looking at ankle monitoring systems, when you're looking at FEMA shelters, when you're looking at all these mass camps, there's a lot of money. So the short answer is that I think Texas was in the right to absolutely protect itself uh, from if the federal government was not coming in. I think 25 governors of states recognized that this was a serious problem. And I think this current administration, regardless of what your politics are, everyone can agree that this administration has failed when over 3 million people have come across illegally. And we have, uh, like uh, uh, the young gentleman was saying earlier, that you have a Congress that can't seem to get along except when it, when it can have a handshake to send weapons of uh, mass destruction overseas for war. With the exception of that, our border is single-handedly the most important thing that we have. And I believe Texas has every right to put up concertina wire. And I believe the federal government has every right to cut it down. And Operation Lone Star, which Greg Abbott was spearheaded, single-handedly saved our country because there's a difference between immigration and invasion. Do you envisage a situation when there's a conflict between Texas National Guards and federal agents? I think that's, that's overhyped. I, I mean, look, uh, the, 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 the Texas National Guard is ultimately at the behest of the governor of Texas, but there is no secession. There is no, you know, I, I think this is more of a hype conflict to sell ad revenue and clicks. This is more of a, of a, of a policy battle, if you will, uh, that has DC to do with, you know, arguing about Texas. There's an election year coming up. 
and both sides are figuring out how to use it for the sake of getting more votes. But in terms of an actual conflict, let's let's get look. I, I'm I'm a former member of the uniform services of the United States of America. The members of the Texas National Guard are uniform members that can be federalized at any point to call up. There's not going to be uh, that's a bunch of horse hockey. Okay. Okay. You made your point very well. My next question goes to Mr. Akshar Prabhu Desai. Uh, Akshar, you mentioned that the federal government should give actually green cards to highly educated Chinese directly without any this thing. You know, Akshar, that a lot of Chinese illegal immigrants are coming from the southern border. And there is apprehension that Communist Party of China, CCP, is sending spies and agents of CCP into United States using the crisis at the southern border. Now, if that is the situation, where does your suggestion of giving, you know, openly giving green cards to highly educated Chinese would be immigrants. You want to make any comments on that, Akshar? I think uh, these things are two separate things. If Chinese party is indeed sending people uh, via the illegal immigration route, I think we need some data to uh, support those claims. We need to see what percentage of the Chinese nationals coming across are possible spies and so on. And uh, my gut feeling is that that number is probably going to be next to zero. Uh, my suggestion was more towards the legal immigration route. The uh, limit of cards for high skilled workers is deeply hurting us. Uh, there are a lot more Chinese people, a lot more Chinese scientists. The United States instead of China had our green card system been slightly better. So my suggestion was more towards the legal immigrants rather than the illegal immigrants but the question is uh, if a lot of people are coming illegally the government has very little control on who is coming on or the any kind of background verification on the people but if we simplify legal immigration routes it you know we have much greater control over uh, which people we let in and what kind of uh, systems we have in place to vet these people so right now the chaos at the border doesn't help this cause at all I think I think as a nation and this forum is about geopolitics, so we need to ask ourselves, do we benefit from a lot of these people coming in or not? And I think the answer there is very clear that we do benefit from a lot of people around the world coming here and working here, especially young people. And uh, if, if that is the case, then the question is, why, why is there chaos at the border? What can we do to solve that uh, chaos? And when it comes to China, I think having more Chinese people in US is going to be better for the United States and it's going to deeply hurt China, and especially when we talk about the spectrum that's highly educated, more skilled, has better degrees. A lot, a lot of these students have degrees in U.S. universities, and why should they go back to China instead of staying here? And I think if we solve that problem, U.S. benefits geopolitically automatically. Actually, your suggestion is well taken, but the issue is possibility of Chinese spies and CCP agents masquerading as refugees and misusing the mayhem that is at the southern border. I want your specific answer on that. Let's say let's say they are indeed misusing, then what can we do there? I mean, the illegal immigration is reality. They are coming in. Uh, so, so what can we do unless we reform the asylum law? But if we can't do that, right, it appears that Congress is unable to reform the asylum law. So we, we don't have any levers uh, to control this in any way. So I, I don't know what, what, what answer I can possibly give here. My suspicion is that this is just basically a, a claim that's not supported by data. And it's just a claim that's being made during an election year to just create fear among the voters and to increase their fundraising efforts. And let's say these Chinese agents are coming. What are they going to do? Like work on a farm or steal our tractors? I mean, I, I really don't know. Uh, and what we actually need is more data and more evidence to uh, you know, support this claim that uh, Chinese CCP agents might be coming in. And if they are coming in, what the hell are they going to do here? Right. So unless unless we have that data, we can't really take the claim seriously. But even if we take the claim seriously, what are we going to do about it? Unless we have like 
only we have only three levers, right? The Congress acts and reforms the law. And I'm pretty sure that's not going to happen anytime soon. Second is double down on enforcement, which basically just boils down to throwing more money down the drain. You know, it doesn't achieve anything. People are still going to come. And unless, unless let's say we are willing to shoot people, which we are not going to do, right? So, and the third is probably uh, is that we can, you know, simplify the legal immigration route. So more people come via the legal immigration route, possibly through seasonal workers, visa and so on. And when that happens, all the complex infrastructure that's developed in Mexico, in other countries, and including in India of this uh, human trafficking rackets, you know, who take money from people to, you know, fly them to Mexico, then help them cross the border. Those rackets are going to break down if we just simplify the legal immigration route for many of these economic migrants. And in that case, the China has slightly less opportunities now to exploit, uh, to send agents, even if they are sending those. But, you know, these, these are the only three options on the table and we have to decide which one we pick. Thank you, Mr. Desai. I'm going to bring in Mr. Thakur uh, because he has some different point of view uh, about the specific issue of Chinese spies and CCP agents trying to infiltrate United States. And it's an important issue. So, Bert, please go ahead. Uh, Mr. Desai, I... I, I am really touched by your kindness. So l let me just begin by saying that um, the one of the things that I've learned uh, is that the world isn't black and white, and there are various shades of gray. And there's a lot of people in, uh, from without who want the United States to be destroyed. One of them is the existential threat of the CCP under Xi Jinping. Uh, Xi Jinping wants the New Silk Road, the One Belt and Road Initiative, to be completed, and one of the reasons for him seeking his his uh, newest term is to ensure that he takes over Taiwan. Uh, Taiwan, if it falls, is going to be our Suez Canal moment, and it gives him access to semiconductor technologies that are the best in the world. Now, the CCP has been conducting a massive spying operation in the United States. I would argue basically since second term Obama, maybe a little bit before, but roughly around then. Uh, a large portion of this, the MSS realize the vulnerabilities and the greed, if you will, of, uh, of the Americans and they exploited the EB-5 system where you were able to purchase green cards for effectively $500,000. Is anyone, is anyone familiar with EB-5? So, okay. So I am, I am familiar with the EB-5 actually. <laughs> okay. So, okay. Yes. Yes, okay. And it's, and it's roughly 1.1 million investment, but yes, yes. that yes. is so, correct. Yes. So uh, basically along with regional centers, who was, you know, the, uh, a lot of the people's money came into the United States. Uh, in Texas, there was a growing concern uh, because hundreds of thousands of acres of farmland suddenly were bought by, by shell companies. And when these shell companies were traced back, they were owned by the, by the CCP. Uh, outside of Dallas, there are multiple very large data centers that are solely for the benefit of Tencent and Baidu. So therefore TikTok, et cetera. And a lot of these servers are reporting straight back to China. Now, without getting too far into the weeds, I have been on sites that we have been making for some agencies within the United States government and immediately next door, suddenly the CCP is purchasing sites. I can tell you right now that some of our missile defense sites are, are, are ICBM sites in the United States. And you, know, you can do a quick Google search where they might be, have a lot of farmland that are suddenly owned by the CCP. The number two most applied for patents in the United States, right behind IBM, is actually by Huawei, a company that is zero brick and mortar, and it's 100% of these are all in the telecom space. 28 of the top engineers from Applied Materials, uh, which is uh, arguably the, 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 the preeminent uh, material sciences company in the United States, are now in China now. But the most staggering one, is how the USS Gerald R. Ford, the USS Gerald R. Ford is our latest Navy supercarrier. I've had friends who've worked on its commissioning. It took 10 years to build. It's got linear induction motors that allow four planes to be launched simultaneously. Well, the CCP made a carbon copy of it. Length, bolt, only thing missing from it were the nuclear reactors, and they made it within two years, and it's now patrolling in the South China Sea. And so, when you have a theft of intellectual property, the tune of $1.5 trillion in the last, I think, five, six years alone in the United States, and there's no recourse, 
uh, there's a lot of spying that's going on. And remember, I, I said this statistic a little earlier. There's, from what we know, there's 10 million MSS. And to those who don't know what the MSS is, that is the Chinese equivalent of the FBI, the NSA, and the CIA combined. Okay, that's 10 million strong. And these people are not, um, these people aren't dumb. And so when you're seeing along the southern border, and I've been to ICE detention centers, that the majority of the people who are being held there currently are actually military aid Chinese men, you know, and, and th those are the, the, the preeminent demographic. The second, I think, was kind of shocking was, was actually Pakistani men. Uh, but when you have that, it, it makes you, un it makes me uneasy from a national security standpoint, especially with some people whom I've spoken with. I, uh, uh, you know, I've, I've learned some things about vulnerabilities in our system. One example that I'll give you is, you know, our grid. Uh, Texas has, ERCOT, it has its own grid, and when you have uh, components, let's say intertie relays, that are manufactured not only in China, but now have RFID signals uh, that can be read and be manipulated, well, it doesn't, you know, it's, it's not a leap of the imagination to have somebody drive around with a transceiver and create some mayhem. So I, I think to your point, uh, Mr. Desai, giving unvetted green cards to people just because they have high skill is not an exemplary uh, solution to the problem. I think that we have enough people here who have plenty of high skill in the H1 uh, and other visas uh, that, 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 are, that are demonstrably high skilled that deserve to have that access. And I think overburdening the system right now with people is not exactly a solution either, because like I said, we have 8 million people who are hungry. We have hundreds of thousands of veterans who are homeless. We have, you know, so anyway, that's my point. retort to it. You have made your point. My Thank you. third question is to Ms. O'Connor. Ms. O'Connor, you presented a lot of data and your data suggests that in the last couple of years, the country of origin of these, you know, my illegal migrants from the southern border in last couple of years, around 49% are actually from other countries all over the world, possibly not from Latin America. I want to go back to the geopolitical implications. You know that 15 out of 19, 9-11 terrorists were from one particular country and that country was Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. And these people were here legally, not illegally. You also know that 3.8 million military age males invaded entire Europe by walking across the continent. And if you look at the country of origin of these migrants to Europe, they were predominantly from the countries in what is called WANA region, West Asia, North Africa region, belonging to one particular ideology. And I'm using my words very carefully. And a lot of these are now implicated in terrorist activities in Europe, having gone there as illegal refugees slash migrants or whatever. You see the change in country of origin on the southern border. Are we allowing would be terrorists from this loophole on the southern border? You are muted, ma'am. Kindly unmute yourself. Thank you. Yes. Uh, so I think that's a great question and one that doesn't necessarily have an answer. Um, unfortunately, today, how do you screen for terrorists? How do you determine who is a terrorist and who is not? I think the best way we can do that is by vetting and having procedures in place. Um, what I think we're seeing is a breakdown of the procedures that we have and an antiquated system of procedures um, that is being implemented. I think we need to take into account the changing geopolitical environment. Um, like you mentioned, of different countries, different demographics, um, different, you know, when this, when our, our refugee laws were enacted, we were, it was the Cold War, and we were afraid of communists. 
that threat has drastically changed. So today we see different ideologies that present a threat to the United States. Um, you know, not discounting what my counterparts have said about the CCP and things like that, but it was in a much different time and our landscape has drastically changed. So our laws and our procedures for enforcement, our procedures for vetting need to change as well. There was no Facebook in 1980. There was no social media in 1990. Um, so again, we need to take those into consideration and, and take those into account as we're looking at our, our, our different policies and ways of allowing people to come into the country. So to your point, are there potential terrorists coming into the country? Potentially, yes. Are they predominantly coming through the border? Possibly, but I would argue they may be coming through the legal pathways of immigration as well. So I think that brings us to a broader question of how do we protect the United States from, from bad actors, whether they're utilizing the proper legal channels of immigration or illegal channels of immigration. Because I think what, we, what you have pointed out is that we have holes in both systems that are putting the United States at risk. And I think that needs to be addressed and considered. Unfortunately, I think I don't think any administration is willing to do that. And based on what both of my counterparts have said, I think all administrations have failed to adequately address it. So whether that's the Biden administration, the Trump administration, or the Obama administration, the Obama administration had the highest number of deportations uh, and of any administration, but yet we still have these issues and the issues continue and continue to grow um, and ebb and flow despite what administration is in office. So Thank you, Caitlin. Uh, yes. You have answered the question and I think Bert wants to join, so I'll let Bert. Bert, go ahead. Well, I, I, I think it's actually very important that we that we take a look at uh, not only geopolitical events, but the reality of what's going on. Look. <laughs> right now, there's a fundamental shift in the power dynamic in the world. And the reality is the cartels that are operating south of the border from us have an enormous amount of power. I've been to places where you have three active cartels, the police stations have, uh, the police department has $4 million in funds and they're fighting something where like in a ride along, I've been with them. And you'll and they showed me a house where they seized six hundred million dollars in cash stuffed inside of the house. You have sophisticated tunnels below the border that can you can drive a semi truck through, and those are the ones that we found. We're not even talking about the lands that are privately held by companies. There is a, a significant threat right now that is coming directly from the southern border, and I would be I would be remiss not to push back and say yes. While we might have holes and vulnerabilities in, in our legal immigration system, once again, if there is an existing pre-existing network of how to a, a pre-existing logistics network of how to move people and product inside of the country without the all-seeing eye of customs, <laughs> okay, if you go with me on there. Um, that is a terrifying prospect. We've seen now reports of bioweapons labs that the CCP has had, not only in California, but secret police stations that they have had from Northern California all the way to New York, where they're literally taking people off the streets and kidnapping them for daring to speak up against Xi Jinping. And so my, my, my biggest concern it, you know, when, when I do get into Congress, and I will, trust me on this, I have far too much passion not to, is to protect the interests of the United States. I don't want ever to be in a situation where I see a, a pair of buildings that I used to play underneath when I was a kid fall to the ground and see, you know, come on, let, let, let's be real. The, the, there's a serious problem and we can mollycoddle around the issue all we want, but unless we fix the border, we're in some serious trouble. Thank you, Bert. I think there's kind of uh, unanimity amongst the panelists about need to fix the uh, legal system and the laws because it's antiquated. I'm going to run through a couple of the comments and questions from the audience. Uh, so the first is from Siva. Uh, 
from the audience, and I'm going to read this. It's a very pertinent question. Companies that employ legal immigrants have to pay USCIS fees and legal, you know, charges that have gone up tremendously in the last few years. This cost recovery is being used to process illegal immigrants processing. So, in other words, legal migrants are being penalized fiscally to process illegal immigrants. Any of the panelists want to join? Is that fair? What should be the solution? Any of you can join. Yes, Akshar. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah I think uh, there are almost half a million Indians stuck in different kind of visa queues uh, because of the per uh, country of birth uh, quotas on green cards. And these Indians have to renew their visa every three years. Has basically sees these people as cash cows, opposes any reforms to the system that might actually free up these legal immigrants from this process of uh, continuously uh, renewing visa. And now they have imposed a $600 asylum fee, which I think is completely unjust. Simply not only immigrants, but these American taxes are willing to fund uh, the mess that they have at the border. I think that's that's simply unfair. Thanks, Akshar. Caitlin, do you want to comment on that particular question since you are an immigration attorney? Yes, and I think it's a timely question because as of April 1st, the H-1B fees are increasing 70%. So as of April 1st, the fee to file an H-1B application in I-129 is going from $460 to $780. Uh, so we are seeing significant increases across the board uh, on all applications in USCIS. Now, arguably, we haven't had a fee increase in some years. However, we're seeing significant increases of more than 50% on many fees. Um, and I think it, it does in many situations unfairly affect worker petitions. Uh, one thing I do want to mention just as an aside is there is currently a, an unskilled worker or seasonal worker visa called the H2B. That visa, I work with a lot of uh, individuals who come on that as a six month visa, as a non-immigrant visa, and it is for agricultural workers. Um, so there is an option there, but I think, you know, expanding that might be an option. Um, but, and again, like every visa, it has limitations on numbers, right? So only certain numbers of people are permitted, but it is a legal pathway for people to come here. And a majority of the workers that I work with are from Mexico and other uh, Central and Latin American countries. So there is a legal pathway to deal with the economic stresses that they're dealing with um, in those countries. Uh, but uh, I just wanted to mention that, like all of our other systems, it, it cannot meet the need. The capacity is not there for the demand. Akshar wants to join. Akshar, have your say, please, but confine it to one minute comment. Akshar, you are muted. Kindly unmute yourself. Yeah, I might have pressed the raise hand button incorrectly. Sorry. Yeah. I don't want to add anything. Oh, you don't want to add anything. So I have seen some comments on the chat function. Oh, Bert wants to say something. Bert, go ahead. One minute, please. Yes, um, uh, uh, Ms. O'Connor, I absolutely want to work for that HTB. I mean, I, I think the fact that you can't use it for, uh, you only use it for non-agricultural work is a travesty. You know, um, that, that's, uh, if you want to chime it's in on that. It's actually for both. Sorry. Oh, it is? They, they changed? Uh, it if is it's agricultural. Okay. It's seasonal, essentially. Seasonal, okay. Yes. Okay. Uh, and and also, uh, as, as as someone who deeply cares about this issue, uh, if you all have data on this, because uh, as a politician, I'm allowed to say, I don't know uh, what all of the solutions are. If you all can work with me and send me data, I'll put my uh, email on the chat. This is an area that I really want to fix. So if you have some solutions, please send them. So that has been very enlightening discussion. I'll just read one comment from the chat room by one of the 
participants or audience uh, who is trying to answer one of the questions I had asked. And the person who has put this comment is Alvin Bedgood, and he writes, conflict is highly unlikely. However, if push comes to shove, the US government can federalize the Texas National Guard, thereby legally removing the Texas governor's control over the National Guard, although the Texas governor would retain control of state forces like state police force and Texas State Guard, these elements are staffed and equipped for law enforcement, humanitarian support, and disaster relief operations, uh, whilst military engagement, but I think he is clarifying the situation. So that is in consonance with what Bert had said. Bert wants to join in? Bert, okay. Just real quick, in order to do that, uh, the president would have to like, you know, effectively invoke the Insurrection Act if he was gonna use it for uh, any sort of, like a standoff with Texas. Likelihood of that happening, zero, but. Thank you very much indeed, Mr. Bert Thakur, Mr. Akshar Prabhu Desai, Ms. Caitlin O'Connor, you know, for giving one and a half hour of your time on a Saturday morning to discuss this issue, but this issue is not going to disappear. It's a serious issue. It requires serious attention and timely attention because I can visualize this snowballing into more complicated situation than it already is. Everyone agrees that the system is dysfunctional. There is no desire to solve the problems. There is desire to win brownie points at this point in time rather than actually solve the problem. But the threats are there. There are geopolitical threats we cannot ignore. We can, you know, address this a humanitarian problem. But when you know that the enemy is lurking at the door and is going to use deception, anything is possible. So while balancing the humanitarian aspect is also very, very important to do the vetting process. So that some unfortunate incident does not happen because of the laxity. I'm also thankful to our viewers. Again, on a Saturday morning, rather than enjoying your Saturday morning time, you are spending one and a half hour on this discussion. I think that shows how committed you are. So thanks to all the audience members from the bottom of my heart. I'm thankful to Team CSA. Team CSA, Mr. Ripudaman Pachauri, Mrs. Chitkala Akela, and Mr. Rajiv Verma. These are my pillars of support without their help. I'm not able to do these wonderful programs. And for our audience and our panelists, this has been simultaneously live streamed on YouTube. We will have a video recording available of this event. This will be available on our website and also on our YouTube channel. We will follow this program on February 24th, which is a Saturday, same time, 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, when we'll have a distinguished lecture by a domain expert on the Ukraine crisis two years after that. Actually, February 24th would be the anniversary of invasion or the special military operations by the Russian Federation into the state of Ukraine. So till that time, goodbye. Thank you very much indeed to all. We enjoyed this discussion and my heartiest thanks to my panel members. Yeah, thank you.